Today's class is a 10 minute university presentation. It's offered in collaboration with and in support of the OSU Extension Service Master Gardener Program. At our website, you will find handouts, videos, upcoming classes and workshops. Our program is volunteer led and we are supported by OSU faculty to ensure the quality of our content. Today's class is a 10 minute university presentation offered in collaboration with and in support of the OSU Extension Service Master Gardener Program. Now, here you see a short list of some of our 10 minute university handouts. What I'm going to cover today, some of the information is in these handouts and we have lots more handouts available through 10 minute university, not just on insects, but on every subject that you could think of. Now, what you see here is just a few of the many helpful publications you can find online at the OSU Extension Catalog. Many of them have information about the pests that I'm going to talk about today. And like I mentioned about the 10 Minute University uh, handouts, these also handouts from Extension cover more aspects of gardening. gardening. Sorry. All right, the objectives for today are to recognize photos of invasive pests and others that look similar, to know the characteristics of the pest and its lookalike, to learn why these pests are considered invasive, to learn about the damage that these pests can cause, and to be familiar with a few pests that, pests that really are not considered invasive, but they are still considered a pest. So let's start with the emerald ash borer. The emerald ash borer is our newest invasive pest found in our area. It was discovered just recently, June 30th, 2022. The adults are slender looking and they're about a third to a half an inch long. They're metallic olive to green. The adults are only active briefly from June to July, but it's the larva, it's the, the larval stage that causes all the problems because the larva eat the tree from the inside out. And when they do this, it restricts the tree's ability to transport the nutrients and water. After they pupate inside of the tree and the adult merge, emerges back out, you will see a D-shaped hole coming out of your ash tree. If you do have ash trees and you see this hole, you will know that you are having a problem that you probably do have the emerald ash borer. Now, if you look onto the right, you will see an insect that looks very similar. Similar. This is a metallic wood borer. The good thing about the metallic wood borer is that it only attacks stressed, dead, or dying trees. So this makes you think you really need to keep your trees as healthy as possible. Now, there are many different species belonging to the Brupestidae family. This is just one of the photos. There are lots of different metallic wood borers also. The adults are called metallic because of that iridescent color that you see. And they range from sizes about quarter to two and a half inches, depending on the specific insect. Now, as with most invasive pests, it sometimes takes years for the predator insect to either make it into the same area or for the populations to, be, to become large enough to help control the insect. So you need to keep your trees as healthy and stress-free as possible. If your trees are infected with the ash borer, it would be a very good idea to remove those trees so that they don't infect other trees too. You can replace the tree. You can replace it with a tree that is not affected by the emerald ash borer. And as of right now, it seems like ash is the only tree that this guy is going after. You can treat a very high value tree with an insecticide. And to do this, the treatment would be a systemic insecticide. And it can be very effective in protecting the trees, but as a homeowner, it's going to cost you hundreds and hundreds of dollars, and it has to be repeated every few years. So that's going to be, you're going to have to make that decision about what you want to do with your tree. If nothing is done with the tree, it will definitely die. It will definitely die. Now, another worrisome pest is the spotted lanternfly. Two specimens were found dead in the Willamette Valley in 2022. This has put everyone on alert to be on the lookout for more of them. They're under a state quarantine to hopefully prevent them from becoming established here. 
This is a leaf hopper. This is not a fly. It's called a spotted lan lantern fly. It looks like a moth, but it's actually a leaf hopper, which sucks the juices out of the plants. It has a broad range of hosts, and they do resemble moths. They're a little less than an inch long. Now, some people may get it because of that red color that you see. Some people may see a cinnabar moth and think that maybe that is a spotted lantern fly. But the larva of a cinnabar moth control the noxious weed called tansy ragwort. And these cinnabar moths were introduced in Oregon in 1976. And this is a biological success story because sometimes when a predator is introduced to control another insect, that predator can also be a problem if it starts attacking some of our beneficials. But the tansy cinnabar moth, and we call it the tansy ragwort, we call it that, the, the uh, larva stage, excuse me. It, like I mentioned, it is definitely worked very, very well. It has black and red wings and are about 1.3 to 1.7 inches. Now, at this time, there are, their insecticides are the most effective way to control the spotted lanternfly, but there aren't any registered for the state of Oregon because we've only found a couple dead ones here. That's why we have not but to, so that's why there are no insecticides registered at this time. If they do come into our area, they pose a significant economic risk, not just to agricultural, but also to the timber industry. So early detection is definitely the key to preventing this spotted lanternfly from becoming established. If you find one, please do contact the invasive species hotline and they will help you deal with this. Now, several years ago, the first Japanese beetle was found in our area. And for those of you who have lived in other parts of the United States, you are probably very familiar with the Japanese beetle. It's a serious invasive pest. The adult feeds on flowers and fruits and foliage and more than 300 species of ornamental and agricultural plants. And the larvae, they attack the roots of the turf grass and other plants. So you can see the adult and the larval stages both are very, very damaging. The adult is about three eighths of an inch long. It's metallic green. It has coppery brown wing covers. And then it has these six small white patches of hairs along the side. And you can see those through this picture. Now, luckily, they are very easy to identify. If you see a Japanese beetle, you, are, you know what you are seeing because there aren't any other insects in our area that look as similar as the Japanese beetle. So that is definitely a good thing. Now, in the summer of 2016, 369 were trapped in Northwest Portland in the Washington County. The Oregon Department of Agriculture had started an eradication process in 2017. Now for the 2022 season, there were 3,254 Japanese beetles that were successfully trapped. And that was a 10% reduction in the beetles that were caught in 2021. And that's pretty good. Now there are commercial crops, traps, excuse me, available, but they aren't as effective as we would hope they would be. Gardeners can choose, now this, I know this sounds funny. You can choose to plant a plant that's less attractive to the beetles, but when there are more than 300 plants that this guy chews on, that might be kind of hard to do. Now you can remove the adults if you see some by hand shaking the infested plants over maybe some soapy water and that will remove them and the soapy water will kill the beetles. We are lucky that the taconid flies will lay their eggs inside of the beetle larva, but unfortunately, if the Japanese beetles took off and became a super duper problem here in our area, I'm afraid the taconid flies just wouldn't be able to control them completely. We would have to work out something else. Now, if you live outside of the quarantine area, be very cautious when you're sharing plants with friends and neighbors. Make sure you are not sharing a Japanese beetle. If you live inside the quarantine area, do not trade or share any of the plants. And if you go online and just put in Japanese beetle quarantine area, Oregon, they will show you which areas are and are not under quarantine. Now, the brown marmorated stink bug is a pest that many of us have been dealing with for several years. 
And it is a very, very serious threat to Oregon agriculture. It feeds on more than 100 plants and it sucks the juices from the plants and the fruits. It's also, some of you may have found this guy inside of your home or your garage or maybe a shed because they are also a nuisance. They do overwinter inside of homes in warm places like that. The brown marmory stink bug has these white bands on its antenna. I think you can see that from that picture. It also has very smooth shoulders and it has this mottled brown coloration. The adults are about five eighths of an inch long. Now, it looks very similar to our native rough stink bug. Now, if you were to look at both of these insects side by side, it would be very easy to tell the difference. But if you only saw one, you might be wondering, oh my goodness, is this a brown marmorated or is this a rough stink bug? Well, our rough stink bug is a native to North America. It is a predatory insect. It does feed on some leaves and the developing seeds of some of our trees, but it also feeds on caterpillar and leaf beetle larva, which is a very good thing. Now, the difference between the brown marmorated and the rough stink bug would be to look at their antenna. The, stink, the brown marmorated has these white bands on the antenna. The rough stink bug has none. And if you will look at the shoulders, the brown marmorated has very smooth shoulders and the rough stink bug got his name because he has very rough shoulders. It is a slight bit larger and a slight bit darker than our brown marmorated. So unfortunately, the stink bugs are showing resistance to pesticides. So cultural control troll is what you're going to have to work on in your home garden. If you have an orchard, you could put sticky traps around the trees. And if your orchard is pretty small, you could bag the fruit so that the brown marmorated stink bug doesn't stick his mouth inside of your apples or your other fruit. And when that happens, your fruit is not going to be edible anymore. In the vegetable garden, you might want to put some row cover. That's that white material that we use to cover up plants so that the flying insects do not enter. And you might try some trap crops such as sunflowers or sorghum. They do like those better than some of the other vegetables in the garden. And if you do see them out and about or in your home, just hand pick them carefully. Try not to squeeze them because they do stink and drop them into some soapy water. Now we're very lucky that there is a biological control out there. There is a little samurai wasp and it is very, very tiny, but it lays its eggs inside of the egg masses of the brown marmorated stink bug eggs. And that's a really good thing. Oregon State University is gathering up a lot of these samurai wasps and they're doing more research and they found that they really work well. So they're trying to get them to spread out into other areas. They're going to rear them up and put them in other areas, in other agricultural areas to help take care of this brown marmorated stink bug. Now, there are two beetles that are so similar looking that people get quite panicky when they see one of these. The Asian longhorn beetle is a very, very destructive destructive pests, but so far none have been found in Oregon. But the banded alder borer is frequently mistaken for the Asian longhorn beetle. And when people see this, they definitely start to panic. Now the larva, if the Asian longhorn beetle got a hold in our area, it would be devastating to our hardwoods because the, the larva is attacks hardwood trees. The Asian longhorn beetle is about one and a half inches long. It has shiny black with white spots on their wing cases. Now I know you can tell the difference by looking at these two pictures, but if you were to only see one without the other one, it could be a little daunting. You're not quite sure which one you're looking at. The Asian has black and white antenna that can be up to twice as long as their body. And that's why they call them long horned. And if you happen to find one, please definitely contact the invasive species hotline. Now, I mentioned that the banded alder borer is frequently mistaken for the Asian longhorn beetle, but the nice thing about the banded alder borer is its larva only feed on dead or dying trees. So once again, we all wanna keep our trees as healthy as can be. Now it is easily distinguished from the Asian by that shiny black dot you see on its head. And there isn't one on the head of the Asian. But 
you'll notice in that picture, you see that thing that looks a little bit like a gold, looks gold. That's actually a pin. This is a dead alder borer. So that is a pin pinning him down. So that that is not what you would see when you see one actually in the wild. The adults and the mature lyra both are about one to one and a quarter inches long. Now, of course, uh, this is not an insect, but the jumping worm is invasive. It is probably here to stay, but we want to keep it from spreading as much as possible. It arrived in the U.S. in the 1920s as fishing bait, like a lot of things do. It has a voracious appetite. And what happens is that they outcompete the native micro microbial organisms and invertebrates that the other organisms would feed on. And that really is awful. They also eat all the litter. And this one, that can create bare spots around. And that way, invasive plants can also move in. What the other thing that these jumping worms do is they remove the mulch. And we use mulch to help cool our soil and conserve moisture. And they just are so voracious that they will eat all that mulch up. Now they get their name from their quick movements that look as if they are jumping. But they can be easily confused with our earthworms, which we also call night crawlers. The main earthworms are the main contributor to enriching and improving our soil for plants. You realize sometimes, especially after a rain or in the winter, you'll see dirt mounds around your lawn. A lot of people say, how do I get rid of that? And you'll say, well, that's an earthworm that has just pushed the dirt up because the lawn was too saturated. He didn't want to be down there where it was wet. But you don't want to take you don't want to take away those earthworms because they do so much good for our soil. They burrow tunnels, which aerate the soil, and that allows air and water and nutrients into the soil. They also eat the organic matter, and then it's digested and released as waste that we call castings. And those castings taste, take, those castings contain a lot of the nutrients that the plants can use. So earthworms are really a good thing to have around. Oops, sorry about that. There we go. Now, jumping worms are also called crazy worms from the way that they move and wiggle. If you wanna see what they look like, just put jumping worm video in your browser and you'll see what I mean. It is amazing to see how those things move around. Now, these worms can be transported via soil or compost or other organic material. So you wanna examine your plants really good before transplanting planting them. And you want to, if it's possible, and you're going out to buy from a nursery, you want you hope they don't have that problem. So you, if possible, maybe you wanna buy bare root stock, you know, instead of something in a container. Now, never share compost or mulch or soil or plants if you know that you are sharing something from an, where you have an infestation of these jumping worms. Now, jumping worms and their cocoons are unable to survive temperatures above 104 degrees. So if you happen to have an area in your garden where you do have these jumping worms, if you try to increase the soil temperatures above this threshold, that would be one way to manage the worm populations. You could tarp a section of soil or compost and that, deceives, that would receive the direct sunlight and hopefully that would kill off the cocoons and the worms themselves. Or you could temporarily place the soil in plastic bags. You could dig it up, place it in plastic bags in direct sun and try to get that temperature a lot higher. Now, so far the Asian giant Hornet, which we've heard a lot about several years ago, has only been found in a few areas in Washington state. It is the world's largest hornet. It has, its sting can be painful and sometimes lethal. I mean, it is painful and sometimes it's even lethal. They are a significant predator of honeybees. So we definitely do not want them to get a hold in our area. They're really large, about one and a half to two inches in length. They have an orangish yellow head and a black and dull colored orangish yellow striped abdomen. Now, you may not think so, but a yellow jacket wasp is actually a beneficial and it is a native here in the Pacific Northwest. They look a lot like the Asian hornet, except of course the Asian hornet is much larger. 
but the queen yellow jacket can be pretty good size. And sometimes people might find a queen and get pretty panicky that they have found an Asian giant hornet. If you do think you have found one, you can contact us and we'll look at the difference and find out what it is that you have. Now, even though these yellow jackets are a native and they are beneficial, they can become aggressive in the fall when their colony starts to de decline. So if that happens, you do want to avoid getting stung. So you can do that by avoid having loose fitting clothing where they could come up underneath and sting you. And if you happen to disturb their nest, do run away from it. Try to get away from their nest as much as possible. Cover your food when you're eating outside. They really are attracted to food, especially meat. And the queen survives the winter in warm spaces. So you once in a while, you might find one in your home or you might find one in a shed or, or your garage or someplace like that. She's just trying to find a place to overwinter. Now, for the Asian giant hornet, the life cycle begins in April. The queen, she will emerge from her hibernation. She feed on plant sap and fruits, and then she'll go looking for an underground den. And once she finds one, she will start to enlarge the colony. And once that colony is established and grows, then she'll send out workers for more food. And that's what we have to really be careful of. These hornets are most destructive in late summer and autumn, and multiple stings can kill humans even if they are not allergic. So please, if you do see one, or even if you think you have one, report your sightings to the Washington State Department of Agriculture. Now, I just talked about a yellow jacket being a beneficial, and now I have it on the other side of this slide. But most people think of it as a pest, and that's why I'm going to talk about it. The yellow jackets are a beneficial. I mentioned that. They can be a problem around outdoor gatherings. That's why people think they are a pest and they can be very aggressive when their nests are disturbed. Their nests can be either underground or they also make paper aerial nests. And like I mentioned before, only the queen survives the winter. But you see, unfortunately, if you look at the picture on the right, this poor little surfeit fly, which is also called a flower fly or a hover fly, she is often mistaken for a yellow jacket and people think it's a yellow jacket and they don't like them, so they'll go out and squish her. But just looking at these pictures, you can tell why people get a little bit confused. Now, she is a common visitor to our gardens. Usually you will see her around bright colored flowers. I saw one out in my garden just the other day. The adults are very important pollinators as they fly from flower to flower. But the larvae, they are really great at reducing aphid populations and the population of other small soft-bodied insects. But our little flat surfid fly is extremely susceptible to, parent, to pesticides. So be very careful and try as much as you can in your home garden not to spray pesticides. So if you are worried and you do consider the yellow jacket a pest, they are more aggressive. I will tell you that they are definitely more aggressive than other stinging insects, such as other types of wasps or hornets or bees, and they will vigorously defend their nest. If you happen to step on an opening or hit it with some equipment like a lawnmower or a weed eater or something like that, they will swarm and they may attack. The wasps they will vacate the nest in the fall. So if their nest is located in a spot where it's not going to be causing a problem, then just leave it alone. Because by fall, by late fall, they will be gone. And most of the time they do not reuse the same nest. But if you have a yellow jacket nest that is in a place that's dangerous to you, say some people have found them under the eaves of their homes, right where you go in and out your door, if it's going to be a danger, you can either use wasp sprays in the, in the evening, or if you're worried about that, you can contact a reputable pest control company and they will come and help you deal with it. Now, anyone who grows berries or small, soft fruit has probably come across this pest. The spotted wing drosophila is a fruit fly, but it causes significant, significant damage to ripening fruit. As the fruit is ripening on your 
plants. That's when they're causing the problems. They infest most soft fruits and berries. And unfortunately, there are several generations a year. And once one crop is done, they move to the next. So they would move from your strawberries to your blueberries to your blackberries as things are ripening. Their body length is really small, only about an eighth of an inch long. They have red eyes and yellowish brown bodies. The males have the small dark spots on their wing tips, and that's why they call them the spotted wing drosophila. Unfortunately, the female is harder to identify. Now, of course, we don't like fruit flies of any kind, but we have a common fruit fly, and that is primarily just a pest in the kitchen. It's not really a destructive pest like the spotted wing drosophila is. The adult flies are attracted to overripe fruits, vegetables, and fermenting foods. So don't forget to eat those bananas or put them in the refrigerator. Don't leave them on your counter. They are the smallest flies that you will find inside of your home. They're only about an eighth of an inch long, tan to brownish, yellow or black. Their eyes are usually bright red. And sanitation is definitely the key to managing your common fruit fly that you find in your home. Now for the spotted wing drosophila, the female lays her eggs in the ripening fruit using her ovipositor. It looks like a stinger, but it's actually called an ovipositor. The eggs will hatch in one to three days and then the maggots will start feeding inside of the fruit. And then the infested fruit reveals this small scar. You'll be able to see this small little scar indentation on the outside. And it's kind of a little soft spot. In a few days, you'll notice that the fruit's going to collapse because they have been doing so much feeding on the inside. You may go pick to pick a strawberry or pick a blueberry and it just squishes in your hand. You'll want to open it up and look and see if you can see the maggots or the eggs that are inside there. If you do, you, you know you've got a problem and you're going to have to take care of it. So sanitation is really helpful. You wanna destroy any fruit culls. In other words, pick up those blueberries that fall on the ground, take those strawberries that are getting a little bit rotten, remove them. Don't leave the dead fruit laying around. This will just increase their populations. You can also set out apple cider vinegar traps. And Oregon State University has some really good publications as do other universities on how to make these traps for you. And they work really good in the home garden. Now, we are really lucky because Oregon State University is getting ready to release a parasitoid wasp. You can read the name there because I cannot pronounce it. Anyway, they have found that this little parasitoid wasp is doing a really good job of helping to get lays its eggs also inside of the spotted wing drosophila and its larva. So, you know, remember how I told you that sometimes when you introduce a predator, it can also become a problem, but OSU has done studies. They've done about a 10 year study and found out that this little parasitoid wasp is not going to be a problem to our other beneficials or other insects. So they're getting ready to release it into agricultural areas first to get the population high. So that is going to be really exciting. Now, if you grow rhododendrons or azaleas, you either have azalea lace bugs on your plants or you probably will in the future. This is a damaging pest to azaleas and rhododendrons. They've been found on Chirocantha and Andromeda. These were introduced into Oregon in 2009. They have piercing sucking mouth parts. What they do is they feed on the lower leaf surface. So underneath the leaf, they stick their little mouths inside and they withdraw all the chlorophyll. And that leaves this light yellow stippling it looks like stippling on the front, uh, on the top side of the leaves. Now on the underneath side of the leaves, you can see in this picture, those black spots, that is actually the fecal matter from the adult after she has fed. The adults are about a quarter of an inch long and their wings are covered with this network of veins. They really, if you were able to look at one under a microscope, they're quite, quite, quite beautiful. Now, the lace wing that you see on the right, it may not look, you think, well, that doesn't look like a azalea lace bug. You told me these were a lookalike. Well, the azalea lace bug, the reason I put it in there, it's not the look that's different, it's the name. Lace bugs are bad, lace wings are good. And a lot of times people get confused about that name. Lace wings are a beneficial insect and they are so, so beautiful. 
The adults are about three quarters of an inch long from head to wingtip. Very, very delicate looking. As, as you can see, you can even look right through their wings. The adults and the larvae are both very important insects. They are predators against aphids and other soft-bodied insects. So their presence is definitely encouraged. Now, um, at the bottom of this page, you will see these two photos. These are a photo of a lacewing eggs on the left and the, the, excuse me, the larval stage is on the right. I wanted to tell you, this is so interesting. Nat nature is amazing. The lacewings are so voracious, ferocious, <laughs> that the female has to lay each egg on a single little thread so that they don't come in contact with each other. Because if she laid her eggs all together, as soon as they hatched, they would eat each other. So that goes to show you, they are very good at controlling other insects. We just don't want them to control each other. So let's talk about the azalea lace bug. You wanna start monitoring closely in about mid-May to early June, depending on the weather, of course, because that's when the eggs hatch. And this is important in the timing because as soon as the eggs hatch, the little nymphs are not able to fly yet. Their wings are not developed, they can't fly. So it's really easy at that stage to take a hard spray of water and to dislodge all the young nymphs. They'll fall to the ground and they won't be able to get back onto your plants. But one thing you need to remember is these insects are on the underneath side of the leaves. You can't just take a spray of water and spray it on top. You're not going to be getting them off. You have to get up underneath and spray up onto the underneath side of the leaves. Now there are insecticidal soaps and oils that work too, but they must directly come in contact with the insect. So in other words, you're gonna to have to get underneath there again, see the insect and squirt it completely on them. Now there are some neem based products that act as anti -feedants. They also are They also act as an insect growth regulator and as a repellent for the azalea lace bug. We're very lucky that we have some natural enemies out there. They include some parasitic wasps, some assassin bugs, some beetles, and those adorable little jumping spiders also help to take care of this. The drought stress plants are more susceptible than plants that are kept very healthy. I've said that many times. Now, if you are having problems with azaleas and you really want them, the Encore azalea seems to be semi-resistant to the azalea lace bug, so that is a variety you might want to get. Now, those of you that have rhododendrons have probably noticed that you have some rhododendrons that have lace bug and some that don't. That's the way it is in my garden. I have many, many rhododendrons. Some of them I have no problem with, some of them I do. Unfortunately, I don't know the names of my rhododendrons, so that's some information you might have to look up if you want a rhododendron that will not have this problem. Now, here is a pest that can easily be distinguished, or excuse me, not distinguished, confused, excuse me, confused with a beneficial insect. This is a blister beetle. Also, they call it an oil be beetle. And it is a serious pest of hay and alfalfa producers and livestock owners because it causes what is called blister beetle poisoning when the livestock eat it. These beetles, they can excrete a toxic blistering agent. And if it comes in contact with our skin, it can be very irritating and very blistering. The blisters usually aren't, are very, very painful, but they are not life-threatening, luckily. And these blister beetles are completely black with this matte sheen finish. And you'll notice that photo, he has an exposed abdomen. Usually, I'll explain this a little bit later, um, but you can see his wingtips do not go all the way down to his abdomen, and they are about three quarters to one and a quarter inch long. Now, the good guys are the ground beetles. These are a predaceous beetle, and they are very important and very beneficial insects. The adult beetles are nocturnal hunters, and they hide in the daytime. Usually, if you uncover a plant or uh, push a rock over or move some leaves, you'll find one of these guys down there. Their larvae are down inside of the soil. And they'll be under the bark or under the plant debris. Both the adult and the larva, they feed on the soil dwelling insects and eggs. They are very, very good at eating slug eggs. So you want to make sure that you keep the ground beetles around. Now, if you see a blister beetle, 
uh, definitely don't pick it up with your bare hands. If you need to dispose of it, definitely use some gloves. The beetles are very fond of flowers and they may drink the nectar as well as the plant juices. One thing that's good and bad is that the larvae are predators, but they unfortunately are a predator of bee eggs. Good thing is that they are a predator of grasshopper eggs. Now, there are many, many different species of blister beetles, but this one I showed you because this one is so easily recognized. This is from the Malloy family, the Malloy oil beetle family. And once I mentioned before, you can recognize it because its wingtips do not go all the way down past his abdomen. You can see the lines. You can see the lines and marks on his abdomen. There are management options that are available if you produce hay or pasture crops or you live on a farm. You can look up some information and there will be information out there to help you. All right, this is the last one I'm going to talk about today. I have seen many clients that confuse the Western spotted cucumber beetle with our lady beetle or ladybugs, we usually call them. So um, the Western spotted cucumber beetle, what a name that one guy has. It's kind of hard to say, isn't it? He can be a major pest in vegetable gardens. There are unfortunately two generations a year. And the bad thing is too, that they overwinter as fertilized females in the soil near the plant and they become active in the spring. One thing I wanna tell you about this, because if you have a problem, I'm kind of gonna go into vegetables here for a second. If you have a problem with a spotted cucumber beetle in your beans one year, you're definitely going to wanna to rotate and move those beans to another area. Because remember, the females are in that soil, probably right where you had your beans this, the previous year, and they're going to, have they're they're going to be coming back up you don't want your beans in that same spot so you're going to move them to another area anyway they are yellowish green about a quarter of an inch long and they have distinct black spots on their wing covers now as you know lady beetles are beneficial predators they consume a lot of aphids and scales and other pests this is a picture of an orange one but lady beetles lady bugs come in a lot of different colors too. And that's why sometimes they are confused with a spotted cucumber beetle. An adult can eat up to 100 aphids a day and the larva can eat 200 to 300 aphids in a day. So we really want these girls around there. But if you go out and purchase lady beetles, they really are not going to be very effective in their garden because once you let them out of their bag, they seem to want to fly away somewhere else. I know it's really fun, especially if you have children or grandchildren to buy ladybugs and to release them. I know that is fun, but unfortunately, commercial ladybug collecting has it's been noted to destroy the natural habitat. And it also has been known to cause injury or stress to these poor little lady beetles. So sometimes it's not recommended to purchase lady beetles, even though I know how fun it is for children to watch these little critters fly. All right. Cucumber beetles, the adults eat holes in the leaves and the flowers of a lot of crops, and they are especially damaging to snap beans and causing, not only do they chew holes in them, but they can also cause, cause the pods to be deformed. The larvae feed on the roots and they bore into the base of the stems of the crop plants. So you could put row covers and that will help protect the flying beetles, but make sure you're not covering up where they're going to be. So con continually check underneath your row cover, make sure that you don't have the beetles in that area coming up from the, from the soil. The timing, you could time your crop planting after, to, you maybe wait a little while and wait until some of the beetles have come. They've already emerged from the soil and dispersed a little bit. Also, you might be able to delay your planting until the weather is warmer. Make those plants be a little bit bigger so that if you do have some beetles around, they're not gonna completely decimate your crop. They're just gonna do a little bit of chewing on it. If you see them, just go out there with some gloves on and pick them off of your crops and drop them into soapy water. That's kind of a fun thing to do. And that's usually what I do every year. So that's the end of this talk. And I really thank you for listening. But if we are not able to answer your questions, my co-host Cheryl is going to join me in a little bit. But if we're not able to answer your questions, just send them to 10minuteuniversity2017 at gmail.com. 
So Cheryl, hello. Oops, there we go. go. Hi, Jane. And there I am. Hi. Lots, lots of great information. Um, I always learn something new whenever I watch watch you talk. So you did a great job. And, I, and we did have a few questions. Okay. This lady has apples. And last year they had damage on them. She did not specify the damage, but she saw stink bugs nearby. And she's wondering if stink bugs or coddling moth damaged her apples. So I think what she's asking for are ways to tell the difference. Okay. The difference is coddling moth, coddling moth enter an apple from the top. And if you cut the apple open, you will see that they are damaged in the middle of the apple. You usually can't see very often the damage on the outside, but you can see it as soon as you cut into the apple. But what the the stink bug does is it sticks their mouths in the outside of the apple, and that will cause this little indentation and this little brown dot. And that's then you know when you cut it open, you'll even see it more. But I will warn you, there's a disease called bitter pit in apples, and the bitter pit and the stink bug damage look almost the same. So if you have that brown dot on the outside and you cut it open and you see that browning on the inside, you, you know you've got one or the other, so then you're going to have to look up the information and find out exactly what the difference is between bitter pit and the brown marmorated stink bug damage. Wonderful answer. That's good. I, was, I, I would be. And then there's a spotted wing. There's lots to look for when you're raising fruit, <laughs> yeah. fruits and vegetables. Um, Larry wanted to know about the spotted lanternfly. Uh, what plants are the main uh, target of the spotted lanternfly? Do you know? You know, I forgot to look up that information, but because it's not in our area yet, once it gets into our area, if, excuse me, if unfortunately it gets into our area, then I'm sure that they will start talking about the different plants and, and to be on the lookout for it in those certain plants. But because it's not here yet, they're mainly just saying, watch for it, watch for it. So I'm sorry, I don't completely have that answer, but send your question in and I can look it up and give you the answer. Great. Um, this is an excellent question. Um, this this uh, person wants to know if I think I found a bad insect in my garden, what should I do? What steps should I take? How am I going to find out whether this is a good or a bad insect? Okay, definitely catch it um, in some type of jar or container. Now, a lot of times if we know it's a bad insect, we tell people to put it in a jar and put it in their freezer and then they can bring it to the any extension office for identification. And we also use them in our display cases. But if you're not sure it might be a good insect, then you can catch it in a jar. You can look at it. You could look up the information yourself, but if that doesn't work or you're not quite sure, then bring it to any extension office, Clackamas County, Washington County, Multnomah County. Um, and if you're in a different area, live in a different state, take it to your local extension office and the master gardeners can identify it for you. So just put it in a jar and bring it in as quickly as you possibly can. Yeah, before you gets, want it to be yeah. alive. Right. Well, otherwise it gets so dried out, it makes identification just a little bit more yes. tricky. Yes. Um, one um, person asked, uh, she lives in Northeast Portland, and she says, if I find a Japanese beetle larva, uh, should I report it? What should I do? Yes. Yes, definitely do, because it might be in an area that they did not know was an eradication area, and they want to know whether these Japanese beetles are they moving out into new areas or are we keeping them under control? Definitely report it and save it. Save it for you. Put it in a jar and save it. You can put this one in the freezer. You don't have to keep it alive. Would they use the invasive pest hotline or is there a, a Department of Ag number that they need to, which is better? Can't remember which one I put up on that slide. I think you did the hot. I think you did the hotline. I think it did. I think it's the invasive species hotline. Yes. I, it, uh, if it's not, they will direct, direct her to the correct spot. Yes. So, exactly. Yeah. Um, will setting up vinegar traps for the spotted wing Drosophila attract more of them? Probably not. They are going to be attracted by your fruit anyway. And we've even, there are lots of information out there and actually people have been doing some of their own experimentations. And we have even found that if you put them out in, in the fall, if there's any happen to be still in the area, then we can kill them off before they come and start the problems in the spring. So 
it's not really going to, they're in the area anyway. So it's not like it's going to bring more in. It's just, it's, it's a little bit better. They like it a little bit better than your fruit. So they're going to go to that before they go to your fruit. Good line of defense. Yeah. Really. Um, one person was kind of a little bit frustrated. You know, we've had such a change in our climate. Some of our trees are stressed. And you said, you know, in order to keep beetles out of your trees, try to keep them from being stressed. And she says, well, how do I keep my trees healthy? I know. Uh, the main thing is make sure they have enough water or Make sure that they're not in a place where they have too much water. If it's a kind of tree that needs to be in a drier area and you have it in a swampy area. But most of the time lately, the last several years, it seems to be drought problems we're having. Also, in any tree or plant, if you have dead parts, dead branches or dead limbs, you want to cut those out because dead areas, diseased areas bring in more diseases and more insects. So cut those out and, get, and just try to keep your plant looking as nice as it can. I guess that's all I can say. I know I think it's really hard for us to um to understand just how much water a tree requires. Um, you know, we're used to having so much well, <laughs> since we've had such a cool wet spring, <laughs> we don't think anything's ever going to need water again. But if it's dry from now yeah. or in June until October, yes. late November or early November, that's a long time for a tree to be um, relying on water that is up so taken up earlier. So I think that's yes. the hardest part. Watching for signs and symptoms, I guess, is the best. Yeah, monitor your tree constantly. Catch it when their problem first starts and not when it started a year or two ago. Yes, that's part of IPM, integrated pest management. The first part of integrated pest management is to monitor your plants constantly, problems. Um, here's a question that's just a follow-up to that if i cut all the dead branches off my trees won't that negatively affect the woodpeckers in the area um <laughs> well i guess it would depend on how big of a branch cuts off um, um right um it, uh, you know if you don't have something in your area that the woodpecker wants to make a home in they'll go find somebody else's dead tree somewhere to make a home in or you know there are woodpecker boxes you know they like they like you know what they like they like little holes inside of dead trees well right. there are red there are plans out there to make a woodpecker box flicker boxes or downy woodpecker boxes that you know they have certain sizes so you could put some of those up that way they'll be using those because you won't have any dead trees they'll use the boxes instead I guess I think of this um, because I have a tree that I'm worried about. Um, when I see the presence of a great many woodpeckers, I start worrying about the, the uh, veracity of my tree. I think perhaps there are insects in that tree that um, are attracting these woodpeckers and I'm a little bit worried about the tree. So if I'm looking okay. for signs. <laughs> but you know, there's two things that a woodpecker does. One is they will peck the insects out of the tree. The other thing they do is they make holes in the trees so that the insects use that hole so they can come back and eat the insect. That's nature is amazing, isn't it? It is. <laughs> nature is amazing. Uh, Janet wants to know, does the ash borer only attack ash trees? Could it be boring into my hickory tree? As of right now, all the information that I read said only ash, but that may change. Um, so I would definitely, um, like I said, I didn't find any other information from the university sites that I looked up. I mean, this is such a new problem. Like I said, it just came here in June. So we don't have a lot of information about how it's going to act in our area. So I would definitely look at her tree and see. It's those D-shaped holes that they, when they come out. Yeah. But I will tell you the bronze birch borer, also that drills into birch trees, also makes a D-shaped hole. Oh, yeah. To add to the confusion. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was our last. Oh, wait. We maybe we have one more question. <laughs> oh, how can I get rid of box elder beetles? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, I think that's an impossibility, uh, actually. Agreed. I would agree. Yeah. With you it's just, um, yeah. They're just a nuisance, and uh, you just have to mm -hmm. get rid of them when they're there. Soapy water works great. Yeah. Vacuuming them when they're on the outside. Yeah, I agree. Okay, no more questions. Thanks so much for a wonderful session, Jane. We learned all, a, lot, a lot about uh, invasives and their lookalikes. And next Thank week, you. I think we have our last session on tomatoes.
Yes. Yay. Amelia will be up. Okay. See you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.